produced during the lowering of the legs or the lengthening contraction. And what's particularly interesting about this type of training technique is that the peak force is achieved during lengthening, at least during the initial part of the range of motion, are greater than those achieved with shortening contractions. And after uh, seven weeks of training, three times a week, the knee extensor muscles, here are the changes that were observed in this study. So MVC force is the increase in strength. And the, the lowest line there, cross-sectional area, is an index of muscle size. And the second line down is an estimate of muscle activation based on EMG amplitude. And what you see here is that there was a substantial 40% increase in strength, as measured by MVC force. And most of this was explained by an increase in the amount of muscle activation with very little contribution to an increase in, from an increase in muscle size. The second example is to tell you about how increases in strength differ when trained muscles perform different actions. So in a classic study by, performed by Rutherford and Jones a number of years ago, uh, they had uh, subjects perform strength training three times a week for 12 weeks in which they used the load was 80% of one repetition maximum, so heavy load training. And as you would expect, they found substantial increases in strength, but the relative increase depended on how it was measured. So here is the increase in the training load across the 12 weeks of training. So it increased by 160% on average, but MVC force, which is the force produced using the same muscles that were engaged, only increased by approximately 20%. So the difference here has to be attributed to an isometric action versus a dynamic action involving the same muscles. The third example is to tell you that when you train one limb, you can elicit strength gains in the untrained contralateral limb. And this observation is referred to as cross-education, which is defined as the strength gain in an untrained limb after the contralateral limb performed uh, strength training for several weeks. Uh, here are some data from a number of studies that have measured the size of this effect. And on the x-axis is the percent increase in strength for the trained limb and the, on the y-axis is the percent increase in strength for the untrained limb. And what you see is that these data points are scattered about the line of identity. They all lie below, most of them lie below the line of identity, which means that the strength gained by the untrained limb is less than that for the trained limb, but it's not zero. That's the interesting point. And in a meta-analysis of this literature, none at all concluded that in, on average strength training programs of several weeks in, in duration, you can increase strength by 35% in one limb, and the untrained limb that is not active at all during the training program will experience an 8% increase in strength. And my final example for this question is to tell you that the maximal force produced during one and two leg actions depends on the training history of the individual. Um, and I want to do this by telling you about something called the bilateral deficit. And this is the reduction in
patient. So this means, what does it matter if this is a type 1 muscle fiber? It's practically irrelevant because what, ha what is important is what are, the, what are the properties of the neighboring fibers. And each muscle fiber in your body has a unique anatomy which contributes to the continuous distribution of twitch contraction times. Here is a second ex example of this. These are recordings made from the longest muscle in the human body, the sartorius. And what they have done in this experiment here, they have uh, placed recording electrodes, five of them along the length of the muscle. They have attained measurements from five different subjects. And in each measurement, they stimulated a single motor unit. And they looked to see at which of these five recording sites they could detect an action potential. So if we take the data from subject one, which is the top set of data here, each gray line represents where the motor unit action potentials were recorded for one motor unit. So when the gray lines run the, uh, the entire length of the five recording sites, that means when that motor unit was activated, its action potential could be detected along the entire length of the muscle. But over on the right here, you see that there are many motor units whose action potentials could only be detected at two or three recording sites. And this means that their muscle fibers do not cover the entire length of the muscle. They do not go from one end of the muscle to the other end. So you might say, well, how could they then possibly contribute to the force being produced by the muscle? And if you buy my previous explanation, the answer is that their force is transmitted laterally through connective tissue layers and neighboring muscle fibers. And my final brief example has to do with some ultrasound recordings that were made uh, over the calf muscles. So in this experiment here, they had ultrasound probes and they measured the displacement of muscle fascicles in medial gastrocnemius, soleus, and flexohalysis longus. And in the experiment, the foot uh, was kept at a constant angle and the investigator passively displaced the knee. So the person is doing nothing, just sitting there, and the investigator displaced the knee. And what they measured was how much these muscles, the length of the muscles changed. So medial gastrocnemius, as you know, crosses the knee joint. Soleus does not. Flexohalysis longus does not. But during this experiment, the length of all three muscles changed during passive knee extension. So the only way that can happen is if there is mechanical coupling uh, through connective tissue layers between these uh, muscles. So this brings me to my final uh, example, and that is how motor function can be improved with steadiness training. So in this first study, I would like to tell you about old adults who were recruited and assigned to a steadiness training group or a control group. And the steadiness training in, involved the knee extensor muscles, and the subjects had to steadily extend the knee to match a triangular template shown on the monitor, and then to uh, lower the leg again. And subjects trained uh, the knee extensor muscles for 16 weeks, three times a week, and they used three sets of 10 repetitions, and the load was 30% of maximum. So we might say this is light load training and each leg was trained independently to perform steady contractions. And this is what a single performance looked like. EMG activity in the antagonist muscle, the agonist muscle, vastus lateralis, the change in knee angle, this was supposed to be a perfectly triangular shape, and then the force measured at the ankle uh, during this action. And what they found is that strength, whether it was measured with an isometric contraction or during a dynamic contraction, increased very slightly for the group that did steadiness training, but did not change for the control group. These changes are rather modest. In addition, steadiness, as indicated on the y-axis, declined for the steadiness training group. So the, fl the force fluctu fluctuations became less as the subjects tried to become steadier, and they did indeed during both shortening and lengthening contractions. But what they were most interested in 
uh, this particular study, if you do steadiness training, does this have any transfer to tasks of daily activity? So they looked at whether usual and fastest gait speed changed, whether the chair rise time changed, whether going up and down the stairs changed. And the short answer was it did not differ between groups. So there was an improvement in the control group and the steadiness group, but there was no difference uh, with this particular type of training. So the last study I would tell you about, I want to tell you about, is they tried a different kind of steadiness training. And the example I'm going to use is the lat pull-down exercise. So here you see an individual who's doing this exercise of, of raising and lowering a weight stack. Um, and the force is being measured with a transducer up there. And this is compared to uh, performance on a machine that was developed by uh, the, a Japanese person whose name here is Koyama. Uh, he designed a set of uh, equipment which he calls beginning uh, movement la load training. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, what's unique about the, the actions that are performed by this ty these types of exercise machines is that they involve rotations about multiple degrees of freedom. So let me give you an example. So Koyama's machine for the lat pull-down exercise looks like this. So what he accomplishes with this machine is in addition to raising and lowering the load with an arm like this, the arm is also rotating in this plane and the forearm is rotating in this plane. So there are three degrees of freedom as the, as the participants perform this action. So I have a uh, video here to show you what this looks like. So this is a standard performance, the conventional approach to doing lat pull-down exercise. And here is the same exercise performed on Koyama's machine. It's raising and lowering the load, but it feels totally different. So the position of the person performing these exercises is quite different at the beginning, middle, and end. It's difficult to see, but in position one, uh, within the BM, BMLT, this first uh, image down here, you can't see it, but the palms of the, that person are facing you. They're completely rotated around facing you. So uh, in terms of biomechanics, they measured, they characterized the forces that were occurring uh, comparing the BML machine and the conventional machine. This is the position of the handle, the velocity of the handle, and even the velocity profiles, you can see it's much more symmetric on the BML machine than it is on the conventional machine. And very importantly, uh, during the BML exercise, the force uh, gets close to zero where it never does on the lat pull-down machine. And also there are symmetric phases of power production and power absorption. Um, so we did a training study, eight-week training study, in which 24 older adults, average age 68 years, uh, trained on seven BML machines. There were four machines for the upper body and three for the low, uh, lower body. The training load was 30% of one RM. And we, exercise, and we performed functional assessments with a chair rise time, one-legged balance, and stair climbing. In addition, we measured force steadiness for the elbow flexors and knee extensors at three forces. And there were, in addition to the lat pull-down exercise, there were BML machines to do what he calls the chest spread, dips, and the pullover exercise. And for the lower legs, there was the outer thigh, inner thigh and leg press. So to the results from this interesting study, the elbow flexor muscles, there was no change, statistically significant change in strength, but the knee extensors in these older adults increased on average after eight weeks of training by 30%. And remember, the load here is 30% of 1RM. In addition, uh, force steadiness, for both the elbow flexors in the top row and the knee extensors in the bottom row improved at all three target forces. So in other words, 
the older adults who trained on the BML machine became steadier when they performed isometric contractions with at least both muscle groups at these three target forces. Um, so the time to climb the stairs became shorter, so they got faster going upstairs, faster going downstairs, faster getting up a chair and out of a chair, and balance was improved. So clearly these, the steadiness tasks can improve function, and so what we were interested in was how can we explain? Was this related to changes in strength, or was it related to changes in force steadiness? And what we see in this table here is that for the four functional outcomes, these are the R-squared values that predicted the variance in the outcome measures, the most significant parameters were changes in force steadiness. So this tells us that, to conclude then, that light load training, 30% one RM load, can improve force steadiness and increase strength in old adults. The strength gains, however, only improve performance on functional tasks when the actions involve rotations about multiple degrees of freedom. These associations, however, have not been examined in either young or middle-aged adults. So to finish my talk, let me summarize what I think are the main points. Uh, strength gains require modulation of muscle activation. That is very clear. Muscle activation can influence the peak rate of increase in muscle force, the peak force achieved during lengthening contractions, and performance on a test of manual dexterity. Increases in strength are often unrelated to changes in muscle size. Changes in muscle activation are not influenced by the fiber type composition of a muscle. Exercises that involve actions about multiple degrees of freedom are most effective at improving performance on functional tasks, at least for old adults. And modulation of muscle activation by strength training likely involves multiple sites within the central nervous system. Obrigado. Thank you, Professor Roger Luca, for the wonderful talk. And now we open you know, for questions. So you can either direct your questions uh, written, or if you want, we'll have a microphone here in front. start with one question then well people oh you have one okay good here Roger uh, I noticed in the, the bilateral deficit data it looked like when they were performing the bilateral contractions there was a more of a co-contraction is it has that been ruled out as a as a factor in decreasing so if, it, if there was a co-contraction you'd expect torque to be less has that been ruled out as uh, contributing to the deficit? So in that particular study that I showed you, uh, yes, there was more activity, EMG activity, in the antagonist muscle. But in most other studies, that's not been observed. Yeah, I have a question too. When you, when you show the data on single motor unit and training, uh, how can you... Uh, be precise that you were collecting data from the same motor units from post training. Yes, I, I probably I didn't obviously did not make that clear enough. Those were not the same motor units; they were just a sample of motor units. But uh, the assumption is that if your sample is large enough, then it act, it's a reasonable representation of what the population is doing.
Thanks, Roger, for this uh, great uh, exposure uh, of uh, motor unit training or the impact of training on uh, force. Uh, the example you gave about the bilateral facilitation, were those only athletes that did um, bilateral activities? Because I saw rowing and weightlifting, which are both uh, activities where you use both legs together. Is there evidence that this would happen, for instance, in sprinters? Um, no, so in the study, which I didn't mention, that was, uh, you, you noticed correctly, so we also compared uh, elite cyclists. Mm -hmm. And elite cyclists do not have a, they have a deficit. Now actually, okay. elite cyclists are neutral. Uh -huh. Sedentary people have a deficit, elite cyclists were neutral, and the athletes who trained bilaterally had a facilitation. So it's really a task-specific It's totally, effect. it's totally training history. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Fernando. Roger, thank you for a wonderful talk. I have uh, two questions. Um, how normal people, individual like us, that have a simple lab without this uh, equipment, can uh, maybe measure the unit, uh, motor unit uh, activation. If you try to do a training to uh, develop or um, improve the force and steadiness in a population, like old people, for example, is it possible for me to use, as you say, the uh, force steadiness as an index for the motor unit uh, recruitment? Is it possible to do with uh, normal EMG? Um, so, <coughs> Most of the classic physiology literature on motor unit function in humans is based on uh, fine wire recordings or needle recordings inserted into the muscle. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, there have been new approaches developed, mainly in Europe, um, and there are several groups, or certainly some Italian groups, who have developed array electrodes that can be placed over the muscle and I recently saw these demonstrated in Germany and I think that is really the approach that we should be following in the future because you can measure without being invasive the activity of multiple motor units and you can get more of an idea on what the population is doing. So I th if you were to invest in this kind of approach I would strongly encourage the multi-electrode arrays. Thank you. Questions? Okay, so I'd like to thank you, Roger, very much for a wonderful talk.